Good morning and welcome to the third skill session hosted by the youth wing of the WNPS. These are a new addition to our uh, youth wing calendar and program. And they're geared around deepening knowledge and skills to make you a more rounded conservationist and citizen scientist. I'm Zainab here speaking to you and I will assist with like uh, moderating some of the Q&A later as well. First up, I would like to give you some basic Zoom etiquette. Uh, we, will, we will be keeping all participants on this meeting on mute, so to avoid background noise and disturbance on the line. Further, we request everyone to keep videos switched off during the course of the meeting, so to avoid slowing down the connection for others. So in case you do have your video on right now, we would appreciate if you can switch it off. We will certainly encourage questions uh, and we, let's keep this door for the end of the session uh, following the lecture. The lecture will be between 45 and 50 minutes and then we will keep a good 20 to 30 minutes for Q&A. Uh, to ask a question, I encourage you to type your question into the chat and we will give your question to the speaker today, uh, Rukshan, and he will answer your questions that way. I will also, I also encourage you to send in your questions towards, towards the latter part of the lecture so as not to clutter up the chat and we, so that we don't miss your questions out. Importantly, please remember to tweet, Instagram and Facebook post about this session, tagging the Utwing WNPS handle. You can also use the hashtag, hashtag education for conservation, which is the punchline for our Utwing program. The Youth Wing was established at the latter part of 2017 with a goal to inspire a new generation of environmentally conscious leadership and practices amongst all Sri Lankans. Since its inception, we have engaged with 58 schools, with 26 schools engaged with in the Northern province and 10 schools from the Central Highlands last year. The journey has been made possible due to the financial sponsorship of our partners in DV Bank who we are extremely grateful for. Now, I would like to share a short clip from NDB Bank. Nidahase Jivatvenava, Gahakula Puru at a Paladaranava, Hamana Sulagat Pirisindui, Parisara Dushaneat Aduila, Venada Parisere Mehima None, Ape Kriakarakam Nisai, Langadima Piaet, Venada Vagame Veda Patangano, Enisa, Api Hiravela Hitapukali Dekapu Nidahas Parisare, Hamadamakin, Medeval Matakatabaganimo, Punchima Kolea Kunat, Polavata Nepa, Pulitin Bahavite Adukaramo, Gas Kapan Neve, Vavan Nehitamo, Nisiles Kunu. Karamo, Soba Dahame, Jag Rani Venuin, Api Hamu Makapavimo, April Visi Devanadate in a local Mihitala Dinator, Indi B Bank Win Panivida Api Kapavima, Obe Jag Rani. Thank you, Indi B Bank. Um... So the horrific events of this week has led the WNPS to declare the 29th of May, 2020, Sri Lanka Leopard Day. And we have a special statement to release in regards to the events of uh, this week uh, in regards to leopard conservation in, in Sri Lanka. And Rukshan Jayavodna, who is also our speaker today, will read the statement to you now. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining this uh, WNPS Youth Wing uh, Zoom lecture. Um, before we begin our scheduled um, activity, I would like to read out the statement uh, that the Wildlife and Nature Protection Society has issued uh, yesterday um, in regards to uh, the events uh, around the unfortunate snaring of a black leopard uh, who was then uh, being cared for by the wildlife department. Um, but uh, after about 48 hours, it died. So this is our statement. So uh, kill, 
chill, snare, and still not care. WNPS declares May 29th, Sri Lanka, Leopard Day. Uh, the Wildlife and Nature Protection Society demanded that the events that led to the ultimate untimely and tragic death of the only black leopard that has ever been encountered in close quarters in Sri Lanka be taken very seriously and acted upon. These indirect killings must stop. The perpetrators brought to justice and change brought about to take strong preventive measures. The society calls upon the nation's president, His Excellency Gotabe Rajapaksa, to join in the strongest condemnation of this episode and use conservation's Black Friday to bring drastic changes. This is the time to act, not mourn. We understand that the leopard once snared had to be tranquilized and cut free of the snare and be tranquilized once free to be under observation until veterinarians were satisfied that the animal was fit enough to go back to the wild. The pervasive countrywide use of steel cables fashioned into wire snares is taking a deadly toll on this country's wildlife. This illegal practice has been ignored for much too long. Wire snares kill indiscriminately, cause much suffering of victims, and cause lingering deaths. The WNPS strongly requests that the government of Sri Lanka calls a nationwide ban on this practice and mobilizes all possible forces to remove existing traps in estate, jungles, and even in the parks. The immediate revision of the outdated laws and penalties must be done to bring about mandatory jail sentences for setting a snare, including the confiscation of personal property of those found guilty. The revision must also cover the Fauna and Flora Protection Act ordinance to include harsher punishments for poaching, wildlife trade, and so on. These killers must be dealt with appropriately. The society feels this episode could have been handled much better on May France. Our country values its wildlife, is proud of its leopard population, and earns valuable foreign exchange from wildlife tourism and needs to pay more attention to individual species conservation. Wildlife tourism that hinges on flagship species such as elephants, leopards, and blue whales has to sustain these species better. This beautiful and exceptional black leopard, a rare phenomenon in the wild arising from the chance combination of double recessive genes carried in a normally colored leopard population, should have been cared for like a human VVIP. Animals such as this black leopard are the rock stars of the animal world, and they are spectacular, have a huge public appeal, and are the object of adoration which often helps better conservation efforts. We strongly feel the approach taken, the attention paid, and perhaps the care given to this leopard during its brief time in captivity was not of the highest possible that the DWC, that is the Department of Wildlife, could do. Considering the high quality, skill, resources, and people it has at its disposal for an incident of this nature, it was certainly not commensurate with the VIP status of the inmate and his Inestim inestimable value to the country. We would urge the DWC and the GOSL to adopt best practices used in other countries who have valuable wildlife resources and have developed successful systems to deal with similar wildlife emergencies with these species. We need greater professionalism, better equipment, greater local and international cooperation, as well as follow a set protocol to deal with these exigencies. The DWC also needs to improve its scientific knowledge base on the leopard in order to better manage and conserve the species. These changes will achieve a greater measure of success than we currently experience. The recent series of leopard handling incidents in the hills and in Dilpatu demonstrate the urgent need for training and capacity building for these highly committed wildlife rangers and vets. The urgent setting up of a fully equipped Wildlife Rescue and Treatment Center in the Hills is a major requirement. Who in government will provide this visionary leadership to the DWC is the big question. The WNPS as a long-term stakeholder and pioneer in conservation and welfare of Sri Lanka's biodiversity would urge these actions and changes be effected promptly so that the common heritage of all Sri Lankans is safeguarded. 
Society has dedicated, decided to declare May 29th as the annual okay. Sri Lanka Leopard Day and invites all conservation groups in the government to endorse this notion formally and collectively. The society will continue every year to call upon conservationists, activists, the public and the government to continually do more to improve the situation and to celebrate one of our most iconic species. Perhaps then this precious, precious black leopard would not have died in vain. Thank you. So that's the statement from WNTS. My name is Dr. Adam Flama Caldera. I'm here today to talk to you about Sri Lanka's most valuable natural resource, its wildlife. In particular, our apex predator, the leopard, Panthera pardus cotia. It is found throughout the island, including the highlands and the lowlands. It has adapted to survive in pretty much all of Sri Lanka's ecosystems. As the apex predator, it plays a key role in keeping the populations of its prey under control, without which those would boom out of control and cause devastation to the surrounding environment. Today, the leopard faces threat from habitat loss and illegal hunting. If its populations were to decline further, this could spell disaster. I was fortunate enough to grow up in an environment where I was exposed to wildlife and the importance of its conservation from a young age. Now, our youth can get involved through the WNPS Youth Wing. The WNPS Youth Wing are teaching our kids the vital importance of protecting our wildlife. Contact them today to find out how you can get involved. This is all of our futures, so do what you can to find out today how you can get involved and become a watchdog for your neighborhood's wildlife. Thank you for that message uh, from our WNPS Conservation Ambassador, Dr. Adam Flamer Caldera. The leopard is a dazzling cat that for anyone who has had the opportunity to spend a moment with a leopard in the wild, it almost inevitably would have been a captivating experience. Our speaker today certainly has spent many, many days and hours with leopards and is going to take you into their world. Rukshan Jayawardner's early career was at the Royal College, Colombo. After an unremarkable academic career, but a great many extracurricular activities from athletics to swimming to rugby, gymnastics and karate, he was glad to leave school for the great outdoors where he was already happily spending much of his time anyway. In his final year in school, he learned about animal diversity and biological evolution under the zoology curriculum. More than any other school lesson, this revolutionary theory first put forward by Charles Darwin more than 100 years earlier and taught by an inspired teacher at Royal College fascinated him and fired his imagination, making a lasting impression. His first job was at the National Zoological Gardens Department or simply the Dehibala Zoo. He had already been a volunteer at the zoo while still a schoolboy, another innovative way of escaping from the tedium of the classroom. By observation and experience, he learned much about animals at the zoo, especially leopards and other big cats. Leopards were to become a lifelong obsession. He also met and interacted with many like-minded mentors at the zoo. He was fortunate to have the guiding hand of his first boss, the then director of the zoo and concurrently the director of the wildlife department, Mr. Lindsay Alves, on his shoulder. Sometimes it was a firm, cautionary hand to someone who was impulsive and often threw caution to the four winds. In, ret in retrospect, he is eterni eternally grateful to his late mentor and boss. One of his lasting impressions from those zoo years is that animals in captivity lead miserable, desperate lives, displaying abnormal behavior despite our best efforts and our scientific justifications for their continued enslavement. However, he says the sights, sound, and smells of zoo mornings he will carry with him for the rest of his life. He left the zoo after one year for higher studies abroad. Today, he has an undergraduate degree in anthropology from the University of Maryland at College Park and a postgraduate degree MPhil in South Asian archaeology from the University of Cambridge in the UK. 
He counts 14 years of field experience as an archaeologist. The work encompassed eight districts in the country, mostly studying ancient irrigation and related settlements of the early historical period of the island. Always fascinated by nature, he sometimes had to force himself to keep his eyes glued to the ground while doing fieldwork rather than on the myriad of birds flying at treetop height. He retains an abiding interest in paleontological research, especially in recovering past environments from the fossil record through pollen, macrofossil, stone tool, and faunal analysis. Between 1998 and 2019, Brookshin spent a total of 1,100 days observing and photographing leopards, predominantly in Yala, but in Vilpattu and Kumana as well. Over these 21 years, he stayed days at a time within parks. Throughout the years, tracking and watching leopards, except for when parks closed for the drought. He's currently a founding trustee at the Leopard Trust, a founder member and chairman of the Wilderness and Protected Areas Foundation, a director at the Environmental Foundation Limited, EFL, and the immediate past president of the Wildlife and Nature Protection Society, WNPS. So now I will hand over to Rukshan, who will take you talk about leopards. Uh, thank you, Zainab, for a rather lengthy introduction. And uh, um, good morning to everyone again. Um, and uh, you'll have to excuse the slightly delayed start. Um, we had a couple of very good reasons to delay today's proceedings. Um, anyway, without uh, further ado, I'll go into my presentation. Um, I am um, inclined to be a behavior, behavioralist in terms of uh, my scientific interest in mammals. And my special focus is the leopard. Uh, and uh, I've always tried to understand uh, leopard behavior or the behavior of animals that I see. Um, if I have questions about why an animal is doing something or a certain action or sometimes even not doing something, uh, then I will try to have repeated observations or get a repeat observation of the same animal doing the same thing uh, to try to better understand the behavior and the context of the behavior and what motivates the animal to do what it is doing. Because I think uh, we are mammals, human beings, and uh, leopards are mammals, and all of us are considered higher mammals. And what we have in common, that is what leopards have in common with human beings is far greater than what separates, uh, separates us and what we don't have in common. Um, of course, physiologically, there are differences. Physically, there are differences. Uh, but fundamentally, um, all higher mammals are united in this mammalian family and all mammals have uh, similar requirements and uh, similar um, well, there is a fundamental similarity anyway, as i go on i can explain a little more Okay, so, well, life for most mammals starts in their mother's womb and with birth. Um, uh, we are all called mammals because we depend in our early months on the milk that our mothers produce uh, in the mammary glands and uh, we breastfeed or suckle and that is our first food, that is the source of our energy and also the source of our comfort. So that is, there is little difference between uh, a leopard's early weeks and months and a human beings because leopards are born um, extremely small and helpless 
and what they say is born blind. That is, the eyes are tightly shut, but within a few days, the eyes open, but still mobility is ducking. And just like a human infant, a leopard uh, cub uh, in its early weeks is quite helpless and is completely dependent on its mother for survival. So um, in this picture, you can see a leopard mother uh, basically grooming its cub, licking uh, the face. And that is something that uh, many mammals that have fur do uh, for their cubs because uh, as they go, get older, they can uh, groom and lick uh, their coats and kind of look after or maintain their coats themselves. But when they are cubs and when they're quite small, they have no knowledge of how to do this. And they're also distracted by a great many things. So they don't do these. Uh, these are a kind of basic uh, maintenance requirements of an animal that has a, a coat, a furry coat. And uh, if it is not looked after, then various things can get stuck to it and uh, its condition can uh, disimprove and that, uh, that can lead to problems. So uh, this is the same mother playing with her cub and this cub is perhaps three months, three to four months old. Um, uh, we don't see cubs of a much younger age uh, other than chance, because uh, mothers don't bring cubs younger than three months out into the open too often. And if they are brought into the open, then uh, they need some assistance from her uh, to just come in. Some lines on this picture. No, it's gone now. Anyway, uh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, and uh, under six weeks uh, and up to maybe two months, uh, cubs find it difficult to keep up with the mother. Uh, and they do need to shift from one den site to another sometimes. And the mother will use three den sites, uh, maybe sometimes four, in a rotational basis so that at all times the cubs, are, cubs have the maximum amount, amount of protection. Uh, because other predators, enemies that leopards have, uh, once they get to know where a leopard uh, denning site is and has, uh, that it has really young cubs, uh, then there could be a potential threat because the mother has to go out hunting because these are animals that the leopard is a carnivore and uh, it, uh, I'm sorry, there are some lines up here. Oh, no, okay, um, uh, anyway, um, so, uh, so at, if the den site is located and is wa it's watched by animals that could pose a threat to the cubs, like it could be a jackal, it could be wild boar, um, because even though wild boars are omnivores, uh, they will kill leopard cubs on site if they can, since yeah. they do know that uh, adult leopards are a danger to their own young and to even adult wild boar. So they are enemies in a sense. And so there is a threat to each species from the other. So growing. Um, Leopard cubs grow quickly uh, from uh, three to six months. They more than double in size. And then from six to 12 months, that is uh, from six months to uh, one year, they once again more than double in size, uh, both in length and weight. And then thereon, the growth becomes slower uh, after one year. Uh, it's a slightly slower pace of growth, but uh, they, 
by the time a leopard is uh, 12 months to say 15 months, it's uh, grown to its maximum length. But subsequently, a leopard will put on weight. Uh, and that weight is not just putting on fat, it's muscular muscle mass. And uh, that happens whether a leopard is a male or a female. And there is a sexual dimorphism uh, between males and females, maybe 30 to 50% uh, size difference. More often, 50%, the males are 50% larger than the females, uh, which is a pretty big uh, difference if you see them next to each other, side by side. And uh, males tend to become more muscular and uh, more uh, heavily built than females. And here, this is a mother and a dependent cub, and the dependent cub is in the foreground, the mother is sitting in the background, and he has wrapped his tail around her. What I want to show here is that this bond between mother and child, or mother and cub, is the strongest bond that the leopard will have till it is about one year old. There is a second strong bond in childhood for a leopard, and that is between siblings. Uh, it could be male siblings, it could be female siblings, it could be uh, a litter can have a combination, two males, one female, sometimes two females, one male, sometimes all males or all females. So um, each, whatever combination a leopard uh, has cubs in, whatever sex combination of, of the cubs, uh, there are different, uh, well, when they, get to independence, each leopard uh, actually strikes out on its own. Uh, but females, female cubs stay at home in a sense and um, share a part of the mother's territory while male cubs have to go out and look for a territory of their own. But that's not going to fall on their lap. They have to often fight for it and assert their dominance in an area and um, fight off other rival animals, other rival males often. And so uh, land tenure among leopards is uh, basically a patchwork of female territories that actually touch each other, on the boundaries, and superimposed on this patchwork of female territorial units are male territorial units, and they overlap female territorial units, maybe three to four females may live in the, within the territorial unit of a large dominant male. Uh, so in the growing years, once again, uh, they, leopards practice a great many skills, that, life skills that they need and stalking, they're ambush hunters. So here, what better uh, target than to stalk and ambush and uh, sees your own mother. So that is what this growing cub is doing. And that's what he's doing is, is an ape bite. Um, and uh, almost unknowingly, perhaps instinctively, he is biting her on the nape of the neck. And uh, as an adult, he will use this bite to immobilize and kill small prey. But with larger prey, uh, he will use a technique called strangulation suffocation, basically cutting off the uh, airway and uh, basically suffocating the animal and not allowing it to breathe, and thereby effecting a, a relatively quick death. So um, these are siblings playing, and uh, the I think the female cub is on the ground and the male is looming over her and bringing the hind legs up um, to kind of push uh, the head away is also kind of automatic training for a technique they will use to defend themselves when attacked. And if, they, if a more dominant animal um, kind of topples you and you're on your back, uh, then the hind legs are used in this fashion, but unlike in this case, uh, 
the claws will be out and uh, will cause uh, a fair amount of damage. Okay. So this is um, camera trap clip of a leopard in Vilpatu. So uh, what I wanted to show you here was one of the central characteristics of a leopard is its curiosity. It's uh, often curious to know what is going on in its environment. And this is a young animal. Um, it is a sub-adult. So its curiosity is pretty high because it still doesn't know enough about uh, what we can play that again. So um, it, it doesn't know enough about its environment and if there is anything unusual, it will investigate. So what is unusual to her is, uh, to him actually, he's a sub-adult male, is that this uh, camera trap is on a path that he often takes and this is something new. So he comes in for a closer look and he examines it top to bottom, comes in for a closer look, sniffs it, and then moves on. So um, this is a trait that stands a leopard in good stead because it's quick to learn about new things and uh, learn from trial and error and learn about its prey, its rivals, its environment. Um, so there's a fairly large uh, learning period for a leopard and uh, right through its life too, it retains the ability to learn new things. So unlike deer or many of the ungulates it hunts, the leopard is a, a different kind of mammal um, and it can outwit and it can outsmart the animals in its environment and it also knows how to stay out of arms way whether it's from elephants or crocodiles or of course human beings and they are very good observers of uh, other species that includes us and i think uh, from everything i have seen leopards have a much better understanding of uh, human beings than human beings have of leopards so that is the the gap that we are trying to bridge so that we understand leopards better and what their requirements are so that we can uh, cater to what is required for better conservation. And the more I see and watch leopards, the more I realize that we need to take a step back and allow them to live their lives um, in the way they understand, which they are able to take care of themselves. They don't need our help. They only need our help when we have interfered so much in their world and uh, they are getting into trouble because of uh, our cha the changes we have affected to the environment that they have lived in for thousands of years. Okay, this is a, a territoriality and territoriality is central to leopard society or uh, leopard behavior or the way they utilize the landscape. And this is a male leopard uh, sniffing the undersurface of a rock, uh, actually a large boulder that sits on top of another one. And uh, it's sn sniffing for a scent mark and that uh, smell as, is also uh, contains pheromones and those pheromones are processed by the leopard's um, olfactory sensors, um, Jacobson's organ, something, uh, uh, organ in the roof of the mouth, uh, that these molecules go uh, enter 
and can be analyzed. And the leopard does get a lot of information from that about the, the identity of the animal that uh, left the scent behind, perhaps age, sex, uh, whatever, various, uh, definitely age and sex. So that is important to know whether the scent is left behind by a rival or left behind by a female a potential mate. And these are the calling cards and the signposts that leopards leave right through their territory, especially on the perimeter of their territorial unit. In this instance, I'm quite convinced that this leopard is smelling uh, or scenting a territorial uh, marker or scent um, trace left by him previously. So what he's doing is he's rubbing the top of his head on this uh, boulder. Uh, thereby, he is imparting some scent on that same place that he smelled. So he's renewing a scent mark. And renewing scent marks and keeping scent marks current and uh, kind of potent so that other animals, rivals, as well as uh, potential mates can pick up, pick that scent up is the way to maintain uh, a territorial unit as well as keep off uh, competitors and rivals and attract mates and, um, you know, potential um, mates or, uh, or partners. And uh, if the scent mark is washed away by the rains, then they will reapply that scent, whether it is from uh, the back of the ear or uh, some scent from a paw or a urine scent mark or a fecal deposit. Uh, basically, a leopard's uh, a scat, when they defecate, uh, it is not just uh, voiding the bowels like we do. Uh, it is, uh, has a dual purpose. It also acts as a, a signpost that is left often in a prominent place if the animal is a dominant animal uh, in a uh, fairly secretively kind of deposited if it's not a dominant animal and then covered over with sand or whatever, so that that scent mark cannot be picked up. So uh, the fecal deposit, uh, uh, the way uh, animal defecates and where it defecates can tell you whether the animal is dominant or not dominant. Uh, and that goes for both males and females, but especially for males, because males uh, have a lot more to worry about even within their own territory from rivals uh, and challengers than females do. But on the boundary of the territorial unit, females have a lot to worry about from their neighbor. So he's once again checking a scent. Okay. Um, I just watch this for a minute. Um, So um, this leopard is up on a rock. Uh, it's a, a male in its early prime. Um, prime age for males is from about five years to about 10 years. And old age would be characterized from 10 to about 12. And old age decline and death is very quick, it's a rapid decline from being an extremely dominant animal that controls a very large territory. And that for males happens because they have rivals all their lives, but it, as they enter what we would technically call old age, they cannot keep and hold that territory against all comers and uh, younger males who want, who are now looking for territorial units and uh, like I said earlier, with the scent marking, 
is information to other animals of your physical status, your age, your vitality. And when other animals realize this is an old male scent mark and he's declining in strength, they make inroads into that territorial unit. And uh, therefore, conflicts occur if there are face to face meetings. And uh, scent marking is also one way of avoiding that face to face confrontation because when leopards do confront each other and actually come to blows physically with each other, they can do immense damage to each other in a matter of seconds, in minutes. And the death of one or both can result. So, once again, you know, any time of the day, a leopard is active and will be involved with the same kind of activity. What you, the clip you saw earlier was uh, when there is good light after about 7 a.m. This is before dawn, pre dawn. This is about uh, 5.45, I think, a.m. So they get up on these prominent places, especially if you are a dominant male. In Sri Lanka, the leopard is an apex predator. So it has no rivals, uh, uh, rivalry from other species, larger cats like tigers in India or lions in Africa. Here in Sri Lanka, uh, the leopard is the prime predator, the apex predator. So it shows certain behavioral characteristics that it, it does not show. The species does not display in other parts of its range. Uh, simply because uh, to act like you're a dominant animal, uh, if you're not, is a grave risk when there are larger cats around. So um, they tend to be a little more cautious, a little more secretive and uh, just vary. And this is about a 40 meter high rock uh, location. And this leopard keeps returning to it because he's obviously the territorial male of that area. And this is in good light. He's just climbed up the rock and sits down because there's a slight, slight lag time in this uh, camera. And you can see him panting uh, with the exertion, which is perhaps he's walked several kilometers before he climbed the rock. But this is that kind of exertion is mild exertion, but they will pant, they will open their mouth, you know, get rid of some of the heat that builds up because Sri Lanka's climate is hot year round, uh, hot, hot to warm, uh, nights can be a little cool, but we have a kind of a perpetual summer situation uh, and our marked uh, climate uh, the changes or differences or seasonality is rain. Uh, we have a rainy season, especially in the dry zone districts, uh, a marked rainy season and a long dry, uh, uh, dry season uh, and a drought. So uh, this is a leopard in a protected area and leopards outside of protected areas uh, are the type of leopards that most people casually see uh, worldwide. And they almost always see them at night. So for years, for well over a hundred years, uh, people who have written uh, anything at all about leopards have believed and have written that they are nocturnal cats. Uh, they are really not nocturnal cats. They have an advantage over their prey at night but they are what I would call a 24 hour active cat, prefers uh, dawn and dusk, so crepuscular, becomes active after a fairly inactive period during the day, becomes active at dawn and dusk, or uh, we see them a lot at dawn. I mean, unless you're going out with spotlights or torches or infrared uh, lamps, you're not going to see leopards uh, in the dead of night. And uh, there are various theories about how active they are on moonlit nights or on dark nights as opposed to moonlit nights. They have uh, eyes that can uh, almost function like starlight scopes, can concentrate the available light from starlight and enable them to see pretty well in what we would consider 
a pitch dark night. But in the absence of all light, of course, not even a leopard can see. So there is nothing called a 100% dark, inky black night because there's always some starlight, some other reflected scattered light coming in and that's adequate to be intensified in the leopard's eyes for the leopard to see clearly. Um, once again, marking territory. Um, it's important uh, to have these kind of scent mark signposts. Uh, I would call them signposts because uh, for what? What we have to theoretically understand about scent, they virtually see. Uh, the only way to explain that is, I read a book by somebody who was a, a trapper and a tracker in North America, and he had spent much of his adult life doing that. And finally, uh, the, all the killing got to him and he stopped and he became a uh, very wildlife friendly, conservation oriented person. And he writes and says that when um, a raccoon or a fox or a hare walks along a game trail or walks uh, in the snow and uh, comes to a, a place where these trails cross. Um, when it looks down each trail, the scent trails left by other animals that have passed, he will see like somebody walking with a paintbrush with colored paint has painted the bushes and the trees and gone past. So um, this animal will be able to decide whether to follow the yellow trail left by a hare or the, avoid the red trail left, left by a fox or uh, go along the blue trail left by a, uh, a deer or a raccoon or whatever. So uh, he's using an example of uh, color coding what they almost see uh, as scent trails left by other animals. And so that is how they come to a junction uh, between a crossroads between scent, scent trails or trails or wildlife paths. And they can decide which way to go, which one to avoid and which one to follow. So um, it's something interesting to think about that we really find very difficult to understand about their world of scent based um, decision making and tracking but but saying that the leopard is not an animal that depends on scent very much when it comes to hunting or avoiding enemies because the leopard sense of smell is not its most dominant sense by far its most dominant two senses are hearing and eyesight uh, so the leopard hunts by sight and uh, scientists believe it has a uh, complex grayscale vision, but I have uh, cause to believe that they see the primary color red as well. Now, this female is uh, also marking, uh, leaving a scent mark with, by scraping, it's called a scrape mark, but in that scrape mark is the scent from its hind feet uh, and they believe that there are scent glands in the feet and that scent is imparted into the soil where the animal scrapes off the leaves and leaves some kind of scratch mark, shallow uh, furrows in the sand. And another animal that comes along will smell this and get all the information it needs to about the animal that left it. Once again, smelling uh, bushes, uh, for urine scent marks and leaving her own urine scent mark with tail raised and a quivering tail. Uh, raised quivering tail is a sign even if you don't see the animal squirting urine, whether male or female, they both squirt urine backwards onto bushes and they use their urine, uh, they keep their urine in their bladder like a reservoir and use uh, fairly small amounts at each squirting, um, just unlike we who void our bladders when we uh, have to relieve ourselves, they keep much of it 
and just release a little bit. So the primary way they use urine is as a scent mark. And they will keep with one bladder full, perhaps, they can do many kilometers of scent marks. And then she's off. Okay, fighting. Interesting, important behavior because they are territorial, they de defend their territories, they hold their territories, and it's through uh, these scent marks and calling cards without actually physically being present, they send a message out. But when that message is ignored and one leopard crosses into another's territory or they are contesting a territorial unit, they come face to face like this. This is something that every leopard wants to avoid but sometimes it's unavoidable. And you can see how thick the neck is. The neck muscles are, have been pumped up, expanded, and uh, the head is uh, extended. It's an unusual pose, but it's, it's an unmistakable pose of a leopard about to fight, warning the other animal that any closer or any more aggression shown will uh, mean they'll come to basically physical blows. Uh, I have to give uh, credit to uh, Sanka Vanyachi who gave me these incredible photographs of leopards fighting. Um, the animal on the left of the screen he thinks is the mother and the two who are fighting are a father and a son. Uh, so it's entirely possible because uh, if a son does not leave the mother's territory when he is an adult or if he returns to the na natal area, uh, he has every chance of encountering his father who will not tolerate his presence. And this is one way that leopards avoid interbreeding, mating with their sisters or even their mothers because there is a tremendous push, uh, a kind of centripetal force applied by the dominant male uh, to keep the uh, adult young males out of that territory, even if they are his sons. But uh, up till that time, um, a male leopard who has fathered female will tolerate cubs of both sexes, uh, but this rivalry or this need to uh, expel them and keep them out of that um, mother's territorial uni unit happens when they reach sexual maturity. And uh, like I said earlier, if a, a dominant leopard gets a, a kind of more submissive leopard on its back, the submissive leopard has a really good defense. Uh, and it will use all four paws with claws extended, as in this case, uh, to ward off the rival or the assailant. And if it gets too close, of course, he can always bite. But in this position, it's very difficult to do any real damage to the leopard on the ground. And often the damage is inflicted by the leopard on the ground to the one who's looming over him. And Leopards have often defended themselves successfully against lion attack in this posture in Africa. And there are several video clips in YouTube if you really want to see how they do it. Yeah, that's the position. All four was extended, uh, fingers widespread, uh, like baseball mitts with claws extended. Um, the leopard um, that is standing on its hind legs is actually jumping back because there is real danger approaching a leopard in that defensive posture. So uh, um, interactions with other animals, um, leopards are curious. They not only hunt other animals, but they also go in for a closer look. And sometimes if they're young, they wonder whether they can hunt another animal, even if it's formidable in size. And they do bring down 
animals much larger than themselves, two to three times their weight. Um, there are records. The record size animals that leopards have killed uh, in, in Africa, I think 800 pounds. So almost approaching one, one ton in weight. Uh, it's because they're technicians and they use that strangulation technique of a uh, throat hold uh, kind of vice-like grip on the windpipe. Uh, so that, and as long as they can keep out of the way of flailing hooves and horns, uh, they can actually kill that animal. Uh, there is a leopard here, and as you can see within that red circle, and he's quite close. And he's watching this uh, buffalo. Uh, this is a kind of a sub adult buffalo. And the buffalo is watching us. So the buffalo is not really aware. And buffaloes use their sense of smell. That's the primary sense, not their hearing, not their sight. And if the leopard is not upwind of the buffalo and it doesn't get a scent of the leopard, then often the buffalo wouldn't know. So the, once again, interactions, um, elephants. This elephant has come to this water hole that has been built uh, for containing water in the drought. And this is a coating couple of leopards in the background and the leopards are not really bothered. The elephant was a little concerned that the leopards were around. There is an instinctive fear or dislike of leopards. Uh, though they, in Sri Lanka, a leopard is not a big enough predator to pose a serious threat to um, an elephant calf. Though given a chance, a leopard, I'm sure, can kill an elephant calf, but that chance almost never comes because elephants are close in its family uh, units and societies, and they will protect their very young uh, very carefully during those early months and years. Hunting, all important. Uh, it's a carnivore, it's a, a dedicated or what's called an obligate carnivore. So it has to eat meat to survive. It cannot supplement its diet with other things. A leopard or a leopards, lions, tigers almost exclusively eat meat. Whereas uh, other carnivores like jackals, wolves, uh, some of the canids, and uh, uh, they can subsist eating other foods as well. And even in their normal diet, uh, you know, throughout the year, if you look at what they eat, they do eat uh, vegeta vegetable matter despite having meat available or prey available because they are not obligate carnivores and they can process some uh, vegetable food uh, successfully and get nutrition from it, especially fruit. Foxes eat fruit or bushes, berries. Jackals eat fallen fruit uh, uh, on the ground uh, and they spend quite a lot of time doing that. But leopards have to kill and eat. And so this is uh, the technique of holding uh, the windpipe shut and the suffocate, suffocation results in suffocation. It's strangulation is what is going on there. And uh, then dragging the animal in. This is another uh, a shot where the leopard is doing exactly that. The deer is, uh, that was an adult uh, female. This is an adult male deer, adult male leopard. Uh, it is a young a male in, uh, in its early prime. Uh, it's quite a big animal, but the deer is equally big. And uh, this is just maybe two minutes after the leopard sees this deer. We just happened upon this scene. Um, actually, it happened in front of our own eyes. And uh, it happened so quickly that it took a few seconds for me to figure out what was going on because I could see the deer falling and then the next minute this leopard had brought down this tag. And um, the female, um, they were 
possibly a coating couple of leopards, but didn't, doesn't mean that they are going to ignore an opportunity that presents itself. Or if they are hungry, they will kill and eat. Uh, but especially, it's an opportunistic carnivore, and if some prey comes within striking distance, even if there is courtship going on or mating, uh, they will kill that animal. And she came and held on to the deer as well, but she was very shy in terms of, um, was very aware of our presence. And uh, she went back in and then was in the outskirts. So they use their teeth, their carnassials. That's why they're called carnivores. And we are not carnivores because we don't have carnassials. But what we are are herbivores, uh, sorry, but we are omnivores. We are not herbivores either, but that's a, there is a big argument out there, but uh, I don't think uh, bioscientists or bio, biologists, uh, you know, behavioral scientists, they have any doubt as to what we are. But we have to look at ourselves as mammals if we are to understand other mammals, because we have the the most knowledge about our dentition, our physiology, our uh, skeletal system, and uh, all these other mammals, their, their systems are comparable. But carnations are unique to carnivores, and they use them as, like meat shears to cut, uh, cut up the meat, and they can also use carnations or uh, the teeth behind, they have some jaw teeth, some molars, to crack the, even the bones and they eat almost the entire animal, except for antlers and hooves. And here, uh, that was a sub-adult male, that's a male cub, this is a female. She's an adult female, she's cracking a bone. Courtship. Um, that's a big male and behind him is the female, and you can see that sexual dimorphism or that massive size difference. Uh, and if you don't sex the animal properly in the field, and you just have a fleeting glimpse of a male and a female walking past, you may think that if you, if it's not a particularly big male, you might think that's a mother and a cub, um, because the size difference is that great as adults. And once again, uh, Courting couple, female in the sand, a male on the grass, and they're distracted by monkeys. Uh, courtship, mating before. Um, females initiate mating, uh, and courtship and mating happens over a three, four, five day period, maybe up to a week. And they stay together and they mate uh, repeatedly. Uh, every, you know, half an hour, 15 minutes, whatever interval, uh, fairly short intervals. And uh, she's wrapping her tail around his face. And often these males look quite bored. Uh, and the females are very active and very feisty during courtship. Um, mating takes place either on the ground or in high places like rocks. In India, I see increasingly they're mating on trees, tree branches. Uh, in India, definitely they have to have a safe place uh, because there are tigers as well in those forests. Uh, so there is no requirement that uh, uh, leopards in Sri Lanka find a safe place to mate in because there is no great danger from any other animal while mating or courtship because that is a distracting time. And so they have to be mindful of that. And uh, ovulation is what's called pain-induced ovulation. It's uh, stimulated by the mating. So uh, there isn't a, a, a periodic release of an egg uh, that travels down the fallopian tubes uh, and uh, is fertilized by the sperm. It is induced by the mating, induced by, the pay, by pain in, because of the uh, physical structure of the penis of the male. And uh, so that is why uh, often females are very, uh, they uh, are irritated and uh, uh, kind of have a short uh, 
temper during mating and they swing back and strike the male if they can uh, as he dismounts. So, and uh, that is a shot showing that. And then, so the male leaps well clear of her and over her uh, body if he can. Uh, but uh, in the previous couple that I showed you, this is in Yala, that's in Vilpattu. And that is in Vilpattu taken on that fateful day of uh, bombs going off in Colombo. So it, it's an unusual country, you know, you had these sublime things happening in wild places and you know, then very extremely savage, uh, brutal, unthink unimaginable things happening elsewhere in the country. And uh, so human behavior, leopard behavior, it's interesting to ponder. Other behavior, uh, leopards kind of roll around uh, on the grass, in the sand. They pick up scents of other animals, maybe even herbivores. They mask their own body odors and scents with the, the strong scents from the dung of uh, herbivores, sometimes uh, elephant dung, sometimes some buffaloes. Uh, he smelled, sniffed for a long time here and then rolled. So we are really not sure what he was sniffing. There was nothing visible. Um, and then stretching, extremely important. Unlike us, they don't, if they're seated, if they're lying down, resting, they don't just get up and go. Uh, they will in an emergency, but if they, are, they have time on their hands, they will stretch their bodies uh, there are various characteristic stretches that lepers do, and I think they, they manage to stretch every muscle in their body, literally, by bending down, keeping the hindquarters up, keeping the hindquarters down, stretching one leg at a time, front leg, back leg, opposing legs. It's very interesting. I, and, uh, there are so many poses leopards stretch their muscles before becoming active. So, um, as we have a time limit as well, that, that's about all I want to say in terms of behavior uh, and uh, I have kind of slides for, but uh, in, during question time, I can take any questions and I can, we can discuss anything you want. Um, and I'll tell you what I do know, or I can refer you to where you can get more information. Uh, just a final note, um, this is, also from a camera trap uh, in 2013. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's on the 6th of August. Uh, so it's during the drought. Just want to show you something interesting. There's some rain happening and that four men uh, in the night, around midnight, carrying uh, meat, uh, we think a wild boar that they have killed, maybe more than wild boar. They are carrying a gun and they also uh, have, each has uh, some kind of torch. So poaching is a huge problem uh, and poses a threat to leopards. As you see, snaring is not the only issue here. And actual people actually entering protected areas using firearms and shooting animals, butchering them, either drying the meat if they are on a long uh, term hunting or poaching expedition and then carrying the meat because dry, it doesn't avoid spoilage and also reduces the weight so you can carry much more, you know, you can process more meat and carry it out, and they carry it out. So that is what we're seeing here, accidentally caught in a camera trap set for leopards. So just, if you didn't get that, that's four men, laden, all equipped. So it, it doesn't happen just at a rural subsistence level because people have nothing to eat and they have to supplement their diet, so they have to go in and chew and hunt deer. It happens because there's a demand for meat from urban areas and so there are organized poaching gangs and 
I think it's time that the government of Sri Lanka uh, understood that if leopards are important, if wildlife is important, that they need to take some important steps and actions. Because this video clip was given to the wildlife department's director general at the time, and it's not the current head of wildlife, and he just set it aside, and that was it. I wanted, we wanted some action on it, some kind of patrolling in the area, some kind of uh, more presence, awareness, because we know, we told him what this game trail was and where we thought it exited and entered the park. But nothing happened. So when nothing happens, when there is actionable information, uh, then poaching becomes a bigger problem. So since the black leopard died the other day, I thought it was good to focus. I put this thing in subsequent to that into this presentation. So just to talk a little bit about the conservation aspects and the threats to leopards. Okay, thank you very much for listening and if you have questions. Yeah, we'll, we'll open up for questions now. And so I will read a question and then Rukshan, you'll answer. Yeah. Uh, okay, we've got, the first question we have actually gotten is, what are the differences between leopards and cheetahs? The extremely different pets. At first glance, they may look similar because they both have spotted coats, but from the coat itself, uh, the leopard has what's called rosettes or clusters of black spots on a yellow or tawny background. Whereas the cheetah has single spots and almost uniformly spaced. A leopard's coat is much more complex when you look at it. Uh, the leopard's build is totally different. It's shorter in the limbs. Uh, it, they may both be equally long from nose tip to tail tip. The te cheetah has a, a, a tail that is quite thick from the root of the tail to the end. And in fact, it becomes thicker right at the end. And there are bands of black around the tail. Uh, and the leopard has the, the same spot pattern on its body that continues down the tail. And so right at the, the latter half of the tail of the leopard, you see like a zigzag pattern. So if you just look at the tail, if you don't get a good look at the body, you can still tell whether it's a cheetah's tail or a leopard's tail. But much more than all these physical differences, they, they have very different uh, lifestyles, uh, habits, hunting techniques. Uh, the cheetah uses to overhaul and bring down prey, trip the prey up, they reach prey, and then use the prey's own body weight to basically bring it down. And then uh, the cheetah uses a similar technique to the leopard to strangulate or get a throat hold on the prey and suffocate it. But the cheetah is not physically a very strong animal in comparison to a leopard or a lion or a tiger. Uh, weight for weight, uh, it is lightly built and it's built for speed, uh, compromising on all else. So uh, a cheetah's claws are also out, uh, partly out all the time and they act like uh, spikes on running shoes. So to give it more traction on loose ground and not to be, not to be used as weapons and tools like leopards and tigers do to hold and kill. Um, the basic, it, mainly they use their mouth and that's also not by biting. They don't do much injury by biting. They just use a strong enough bite to shut off that windpipe. Uh, they think that the cheetah's bite is light compared to a leopard's or a tiger's and often does not puncture the throat when a cheetah holds an animal. But more than any other animal on earth, a cheetah is an incredibly fast animal, the fastest mammal on earth. And you have to see a cheetah hunt to believe the speed it gets up to. First time I saw cheetahs hunting on the horizon and sending up dust clouds, maybe 80 to 100 feet in the air. Uh, they look like sports cars or racing cars or drag racers. They, unless you look through the binoculars and track them and follow them, 
nothing non-mechanical you would think moves that fast. So. The, another question we have is uh, from somebody, somebody who has observed two males together with a female. One male then mated with the female while the other watched. Had never heard of this before. However, recently saw a video clip of the same behavior at Londonosi. Has this been observed on other occasions in Sri Lanka? Yes, I think a couple of people have. Uh, I have seen two males, uh, um, one mating and the other not mating with the female, but it was actually, a, uh, the other male was sub-adult and it was probably didn't have much of knowledge of mating anyway, but the female was in estrus, so she was willing to mate with either male. And there wasn't a great rivalry between the two males. So I really don't know the exact relationship between those two males. Uh, but I think this kind of incident is being observed more and more recently. And recent research, uh, a recent research paper published uh, just a few months ago, I think it was in December last, uh, talks about leopards uh, responding to pressure uh, around protected areas and leopards in human dominated landscapes uh, and the prevalence or the, the incidence and risk of inbreeding. So we could be seeing dynamics that have little to do with the way leopards traditionally partition the landscape uh, and that land tenure and those female territorial units that did not overlap and those male territorial units that overlap female territorial units and the exclusivity of use of these home ranges and territories. So uh, there may be some overlap going on, there may be some association of related individuals and uh, maybe some incestual mating. And uh, that does not bode well for the long-term conservation of those populations. And there is some, some worrying um, observations from Yala too, that now kind of start making sense. And I also have to rethink some of the things I've heard about a mother mating with a son. Uh, I thought, okay, this is definitely a misidentification, but perhaps it isn't. So I have to revisit that whole sighting and talk to those who saw it and look at the spot pattern IDs on both the male and the female and see whether it is indeed what, what they say they saw is what they saw. Thanks. Um, is there any difference, any behavioral difference between dry zone leopards and upcountry leopards? Behavioral, I don't know. I don't think so. I think upcountry leopards need to learn a lot more about people and how to avoid people and how to live their lives around people because they live in a human dominated landscape. Uh, outside of the few small protected areas, one kind of large protected area, peak wilderness, the others are very small and they exist in a landscape that is like a sea of plantations, tea plantations and settlements. So uh, they have a very different, uh, they need uh, a different skill set uh, to survive. Um, so behavior, yeah, certainly they are using the landscape at times that human beings are not really using it. Uh, so they are by and large nocturnal, but also diurnal when they are out in the daytime, they somehow seem to time their activities and um, research by uh, Anjali Watson and Andrew Kittle in the hills shows that they're using the same trails that human beings use, but at different times. So they're partitioning the, the way they use the landscape. Um, so other than that, it's the same species, it's the same subspecies. Some cold adaptation, yes, definitely. Uh, the coat can be different. But uh, other than that, no, I wouldn't think. Nothing significant. Uh, somebody's asking, some, some zoo leopards are lazy, they're always sleeping. 
but young leopards uh, tend to be more active, I, I suspect she means in the, mm -hmm. in the wild, what is the reason for such behavior? A zoo leopard has very little option other than to laze around and sleep. What can it do? If it's in a cage, uh, if it needs even to be active or exercise, it needs, it just paces up and down or goes round and round that cage. So that is why uh, zoos worldwide have gone for open plan exhibits where there is natural vegetation inside the cages and the uh, restrictions or the cage itself doesn't even look like a cage and it's uh, kind of a moated area and uh, maybe there are fences but the fences are not that easily visible. Uh, it's very difficult to contain leopards in any kind of cage so uh, the old-fashioned barred cages, steel bars with uh, cross members to strengthen the steel bars were used to contain big cats, including leopards, because otherwise they'll even expand those vertical bars and get out. And I have seen in Azu uh, leopards uh, running like in a like a well of death up up the side of the wall, two or three steps on the roof. Just by sheer momentum, the leopard walks on the roof of the cage. So you can imagine the, how big the cage is. These cages are tiny, maybe uh, you know, few meters, three, four meters in length, uh, four, five meters maximum, and three meters wide. So the leopard constantly runs up the wall, on the roof, down the other wall, jumps down, and continues. So, so that's if if you want an a leopard being active in a cage, that's what it has to do. Otherwise, it will be lethargic. And I think they also feel probably dispirited and uh, despondent sometimes. And they do have emotions. So for years, scientists were also trying to show or say that leopards don't, or these other mammals don't have emotions, don't have, you know, the, the gap between humans and the range of behaviors and uh, emotions that humans have and other mammals have through our knowledge and observation and sheer statistical data now has narrowed. So that's all I can say about that. I'm not one for zoos, and, uh, but I, I know some zoos do good work, and, but certainly not our zoos. Please describe why the leopard hates the grey langua. To kill the latter at any possible opportunity, is the leopard intelligent enough to understand the communication of the langua with the leopards, uh, prey, especially the deer as well? So, the alarm calling, do they recognize the calls? Um, no, I, I don't think there is any particular hate, but langurs are also curious animals and they also can't leave well enough alone and if they see a leopard not only do they set off an alarm call but they follow the animal around and try to uh, you know break branches off that will fall on the leopard or you know jump around and um, there is a almost a, a kind of a, a kind of, like almost fatal curiosity in languages when uh, confronted by leopards or when they see leopards. They also know that leopards are able tree climbers. So even being up on, in trees is not, not a real protection. So that is why langurs, the alarm call of the langur is probably the best indication that there is a leopard around because deer can give alarm calls that are false alarms because they can smell something they think thought they smelled a leopard, they will give an alarm call. They see something moving in the bushes, they think it's a leopard, and uh, they start giving an alarm call, but it could be a, some other animal. It could be another deer. I have seen that happen to mistake an identity. But langurs have much better eyesight, full color vision like us being fellow primates. So they don't make those visual mistakes. So they look carefully till they are sure that they're seeing a leopard and then all hell breaks loose in alarm network. Um, but young leopards are taught by their mothers and have actually watched it to hunt 
Langers, and she strategically set herself on the main uh, uh, fork of the tree. And uh, the uh, cubs, two cubs, were sent up into the branches to chase the Langers all over that tree. And that tree was isolated. It was a large tamarind. And uh, they couldn't jump from that tree to any other tree. There weren't any trees around, only some low scrub and some, you know, grassland. So uh, it's one of the first animals I think uh, a young leopard will try to practice its hunting skills on. But in a sense, as leopards grow older, they seem to outgrow their interest in langurs because they, they're just a, it, as far as a meal goes, it's just a large snack. And a leopard will consume the entire langur in kind of one sitting if it wants to. Where they can eat up to about 15 kilograms of meat. Langer is hardly that in weight. So those are the reasons. So you mentioned that you think leopards can see some primary colors. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Okay, for a while, um, some scientists in Africa have observed that lions could be reacting to the color red. I have been in uh, an African park once and uh, a few lionesses walked past some tourist vehicles and uh, one lioness glanced up into another vehicle and uh, she just visibly jumped. She almost left the ground. Uh, she got a start and then she like had another look and continued. So I observed this and I asked the, uh, the tracker, the guide driver that we had, what was, what was that? Why did that lioness react like that? Um, he said, oh, it's because uh, the, the woman in the, she was a European, was, uh, had a Maasai shawl. And a Maasai shawl is a red, uh, with a black design, it's quite a, a kind of a blood red, uh, kind of dark uh, blood red uh, color, the shawl. So, um, so he said, well, the lioness uh, and lions fear the Maasai because the Maasai have been, there is conflict with lions and they kill their cattle, they spear them. And there's a tradition of spearing lions and young men uh, come of age, they have to spear a lion and kill a lion by themselves. So this age-old rivalry and apprehension fear is there. And so that's a Maasai shawl. So she reacted for the shawl. So I said, in that case, it can't be the pattern because there are other printed uh, patterns and uh, she's reacting to the color. So she's obviously able to see red. So that I thought about it, I thought loud, I talked to him. He had no firm view on that. And then uh, subsequently, I've been thinking about this a lot. And I think if, if there's any one color that a, a predator, uh, a big cat should see, it's red. Because if a, a lion or a leopard injures, well, attacks an animal in a herd, and causes injury, uh, and, but it gets away, it's in the interest of that predator to quickly locate that animal that it wounded and attack it again, bring it down, because that is now the most vulnerable animal in that group or herd. So the quickest way of locating the wounded animal is to look at the blood from the wound. And blood is blood red, what are the colors? So if you're seeing one color and that's primary, the primary color, color red, in a complex grayscale uh, vision or picture, then you pick that wound, the blood from the wound up from a great distance because it will stand out against the background muted grays. So that is also why I think if they have ability to see color, 
there's the one color is red plus this age old uh, practice of um, showing like a red flag to a bull um, that saying why, where does that come from? Why a red flag? Why not a yellow flag? Why not a white flag? Why does it have to be a red flag? Because bulls, are, just like leopards, are supposed to be only able to see black and white, or now what we call a complex grayscale. So what difference does it make? What color flag you show a bull? You just wave something, and that should make him angry. But they believe that a red flag is the most effective. And I've also read that um, little girls in red skirts or people wearing red shirts walking across fields can provoke a bull in a far corner of that field to take an interest and come charging along so why so i think we need to because we can't we can only look at a animal's eye structure and understand uh, the kind of vision we can look at the rods and cones and more cones means color vision, more rods means night vision or uh, you know, low light capability. So these cats have more rods and low light capability. Uh, but perhaps we need to examine their cones a little better to see whether they are developed enough or different enough from some of the other herbivores or other animals that we definitely know can only see in grayscale. Could you explain something on the dynamics of prey density and leopard population, especially the effect that poaching, even in a perceived small number, can have on a leopard population? Well, leopards uh, being predators uh, exist in the landscape. Their density is linked to the prey density. So there is a, a direct relationship, a ratio, um, say, 250 prey animals uh, in a given area, say three square kilometers or two square kilometers to one leopard, you know, the territorial unit uh, that can support. So the territorial unit size also depends on the prey density. Then the number of individuals in the larger landscape that can be supported by those prey numbers will depend on prey density. So the, the ratio, the, it's a set ratio. I am not really sure what the ratio is because it doesn't depend on one, one mammal. I mean, the leopard doesn't live off just spotted deer, which might be the primary prey animal or some, or when the population becomes skewed, the leopard population will also change. So um, Last part of that question. Or does, uh, does poaching affect? Uh, yeah, so leopard? poaching will definitely affect that. Definitely. Uh, so the less prey animals in a given area, uh, the fewer leopards will be able to live off that prey. Uh, that is really the staff of life for the leopard. And it's not going to eat, switch to eating grass or seeds or fruit because there are fewer prey animals. The breeding success uh, will uh, be affected and that therefore the population size of predator will reduce. So it is more important. The most important conservation focus is to prevent further loss of habitat and forest cover or you know leopards adapt to various types of habitat, so suitable habitat. Uh, second most important is to secure the prey base. Uh, make sure that deer, samba, barking deer, pig, uh, are, uh, those populations don't crash due to poaching or large numbers being taken out would affect the leopards. So uh, it doesn't have to be direct killing of leopards that affect the population size or the population viability. How can we educate communities to respond when leopards do get caught in snares or traps? What could they do to give the animal the best chance to survive? I think the first thing is if certainly if they're not involved in the snaring or trapping, uh, 
if they are, let, that's another story because they are the last people who are going to inform unless they can put this crime on somebody else. Uh, they need to inform the authorities. They need to inform the wildlife department. Uh, the police is not ideal because the police is not educated enough on a rapid response to this type of thing or how they should, I, I think these, the connections between the police stations in these rural areas and the wildlife department have to be strengthened. The police also need to be educated about what their role is in these situations. And there needs to be a liaison between the police and the wildlife department in response. But the wildlife department also needs to have rapid response capability and some maybe a hotline that is always open and available to emergency calls of this nature. And so just telling them to do something is not enough. On the side of the wildlife department, there has to be the capacity, readiness, motivation to respond. Yeah. Is the behavior uh, the same between black leopards and normal leopards, since they're from the same genetics? But have you had a chance to study them or has there any research been done by you or by WNPS? Because it is said that leopard turning black is because of a genetic mutation. So it could change some behavior patterns as well. No, I don't think behavior patterns will change at all. Um, it, it may be aware that it's black coat uh, is, I, I think all leopards are almost instinctively aware uh, of the camouflage capability of their coat and what kind of background best suits concealment. And when they hunt, where they hide, how they hide, tells you that they are very aware of how the disruptive, what's called disruptive camouflage of a normally patterned a colored coat acts. So therefore, I believe that a black leopard also knows that he is best, he or she is best concealed in the shadows, in dark places, uh, where the light is not falling, in a, a kind of a light and shade patchwork inside a forest. If a black leopard wants to not be seen, he will stop walking where the deepest shadow has fallen, rather than in a patch of light. But for a spotted leopard, the, the, the concern would be different. He, he would stop where it's very dappled or his, back, his background is a bush that is catching light or has leaves roughly the shape of the rosettes on his coat. I have seen that happen all the time. So much so that they seem to know how to merge with their background so that they disappear from sight, especially at dawn and dusk. Um, most people without a trained eye will not see leopards at dawn and dusk uh, who are walking at a distance against vegetation. And especially if they stop, uh, it's extremely difficult to show that leopard to someone who doesn't know how, how well a leopard can camouflage itself. Yeah. So that's, that's the long answer. And this is going to be the final question for today. Uh, any thoughts on strategies to protect leopards that live outside our protected area networks? Yeah, that's what we are all worrying about. I mean, uh, the... I don't believe that the wildlife department has any real strategy uh, for some 75, I don't know, 80 years of their existence. Uh, they have um, not focused on animals, let alone leopards, outside of protected areas. They are very reactive when something happens outside of a protected area. And often I think they'd rather not react. They'd rather not know something is happening. And if the problem resolves itself, uh, better for them. So I think there has to be a serious rethink of how they view um, the animals that they are expected to protect. The legislation exists. There is pretty much blanket protection for species in Sri Lanka. There's a short negative list. Basically, 
a few named individual species are unprotected. So wherever they live, whether they live inside a national park, a sanctuary, a forest reserve, uh, uh, or out there in the human dominated landscape of tea estates, rubber estates, they are all protected. So it's not a, it's not the, the jurisdiction, the, the legal uh, status and protection of the land that protects the animal. The animal is protected regardless of where it lives. But that message somehow doesn't seem to be resonating with the wildlife department. And conservation organizations like WNPS and others have a real problem with that because conservation cannot be done just using human um, man-made boundaries um, that are really only existing on maps because animals are flowing in and out of those protected areas. And they have always lived uh, both in and outside protected areas because these protected areas are artificial imposition, a grid work that we have put there. So what part do they play in that? None. Thank you, Rokshan, for that fantastic session today and sharing with us all this knowledge. Uh, you are really a wealth of knowledge on leopards in Sri Lanka. So it is really incredible to have you join in and share this with a fantastic audience as well. Uh, we've had many people join us over Zoom and many joining via Facebook Live as well. We will also be keeping a record of this uh, session and we will be uploading it on YouTube. So in case anybody did miss out, it will be available to watch later. Before we wrap up, I have a few things, a few announcements, few more announcements to make. Uh, first up, we have got a new look website that has been launched by the WNPS. So please do go and check that out. I have got that up on the screen right now. And if you are not a member of the society, I really encourage you to take up membership and support the society. Uh, because through the membership, you, there are certain benefits you get. You get a magazine and you're also supporting, supporting conservation and conservation of species like the leopard. We've also got some events coming up uh, in the coming weeks. We have uh, gotten, well, on Thursday, on the 4th of June, we have, we're going to be announcing the winner of Backyard Wildlife, which has been a kids uh, photography competition. And we're going to have a special garden safari with uh, Abhijah taking you on a garden safari prior to announcing the competition winners. On the 13th of June, we have gotten a, a marine chat with Nishan Pereira. So do tune in for that as well. And before I sign off, I just want to say thank you to the WNPS IT crew who allows us to get, utilize Zoom. And we have had a reasonably smooth session because of a lot of work that happens on the back end. So thank you to that team. Uh, I know we had a few technical difficulties, but I suppose it's all a learning curve for everyone here. And as we move forward, we will, I'm sure, iron out the usual difficulties we had. So thanks again, and have a lovely weekend. Thank you for listening. Thanks.